The Wise Owl Talks to Michael Dylan Welch, a world-renowned haiku poet. Michael is a leader in the haiku community, teaching and writing hundreds of poems, poetry books, essays, reviews about haiku. His haiku have been carved into stone in New Zealand, printed on balloons in LA, and read for the Empress of Japan and at the Baseball Hall of Fame. His writing has appeared in countless journals, blogs, radio shows, et al. His website, Grace Guts, is a treasure trove of haikai resources, and it's my favorite go-to place. Welcome, Michael, to a tete-a-tete -tete with Nina Singh from The Wise Owl. The Wise Owl is an international literary and art magazine, and Rachna Singh is the principal editor, and I'm grateful to her for this opportunity to chat with you. It's a pleasant morning here in India, and for you, it's Friday night. So, Michael, how are you? Very good, thanks, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, share haiku. Thank you. And, you know, it's a delight to go through uh, the haiku notebooks on your website, Grace Guts. The name fascinated me. So I read, graced with guts and gutted with grace. Squeeze your nuts and open your face by Cummings and in From No Thanks. And I, I just wondered how important these two things are for writing poetry, grace and guts. I had not thought of it that way. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think you want to be, by gracious, yeah. I think you want to be uh, refined and oh. smooth and yes. crafted, well-crafted. Right. And I guess the guts part of it is not to be afraid. Not to be afraid. Um, and the poem, the E.E. E. Cummings poem, is um, rather direct. Um, um, but <laughs> when it occurred to me, I, I was reading that poem yeah. and I thought the word race guts derived from that poem would make a nice website title, yes. something different than just naming it after myself. Um, <clears throat> so there you go. That's uh, how it Beautiful. came about. But it's yeah, great. it's the idea of, of combining extremes, yeah. you know, um, the beauty, beautiful and the ugly um, to taste all of life. Yeah. In, in poetry yeah. and to recognize that it all has value light and shade yeah absolutely yes. light and shade so tell us about your haiku notebook and how you keep track of your poems yeah my process uh which started before i had a computer was i would always write haiku in a notebook here's my current one uh just yeah. small, <laughs> small handheld uh, yeah. pocket-sized notebook yeah. um i tend to work out poems a lot in my head. Uh, and I'm speaking of haiku here, or tanka, uh, to a lesser degree. And I'll work them out in my head and then write them in my notebook. So I, I sort of say them to myself uh, quite a few times and revise it. And then by the time it's written down, it's fairly refined. So I don't have a lot of revisions in my notebook. But my process is to basically just let the notebook accumulate poems. And occasionally I'll, I'll dip into it for if I want to send something out, but mostly I don't. I, I try not to choose poems from the notebooks to publish until I finish the entire notebook, which takes a year or more. Hmm. And uh, I'm, it's you know uh, end of November of 2022, and I'm actually working on notebooks from 2015. Um, so I have, <laughs> I have seven years of seven notebooks years that I've mostly, yeah, seven years of notebooks uh, that I've barely touched to submit poems from. So when people say, when they read in magazines, oh, I really like what you're writing lately. Um, the secret is, well, what you're reading is actually what I was writing seven or eight or nine years ago. There are exceptions to that, especially <laughs> if something is topical like pandemic poems. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there are other exceptions, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's my process. And um, after a year, I'll go through the notebook and decide which poems still s s seem strongest. And then I'll transfer them to index cards. 
And this is an old system before I had a computer and I still use it. Um, and it, it actually has some benefits over the computer. Definitely some drawbacks, but um, on the index cards, I'll keep track of where I've submitted a poem and when I got the response and where it's published and so on. And then I move the index card to an appropriate container uh, or it's now many containers or uh, you know whether it's published or, or rejected or whatever, or awaiting publication. Um, and this is for haiku and tanka. For longer poems, I don't use a note. I don't use the same notebook. I, I either write directly in the computer or in other notebook books with pages. And you have a haiku notebook on your website. I have a page for my haiku notebooks. It shows yeah. pictures of, of all the past notebooks. Yes. And when I was putting that that page together and did the math based on the number of poems per page mm -hmm. and the number of pages in all the notebooks that I've written, it's rather startling to me. I've averaged one haiku a day since 1990. Mind -blowing. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a, it's a lot of a lot of writing, and um, it's it's amazing to me that I've averaged that much. Um, but yeah, that's that's the, the pace I've managed, and it's definitely not one haiku a day. I'll I'll write ten one day, and then none for the next seven days or something. Michael, you have edited several collections of uh, Japanese uh, poetry, Hundreds uh, Haiku, Renge. The viewers would love to know what attracted you to haiku and other related uh, genres of poetry. Who introduced you to this form? And was there any creative mentor who encouraged you to study and then pen this form of poetry? Yeah, I, um, well, to back up a bit, my middle name is Dylan and I was named after Dylan Thomas, uh, the Welsh mm. poet. Yeah. And my, I, I am British citizen and mm. born in England. Um, my parents weren't particularly poetry fans, mm. but they did name me after Dylan Thomas. Yeah. And I think that gave me an awareness of poetry more than my siblings as, mm. as a kid. And I definitely wrote a lot of poetry, mm. even as a child and as a teenager. Um, so in high school- so What was that I, poetry which you wrote as a child? What was that? Was that uh, free verse? Uh, free verse, uh, some rhyming metrical verse as well. Yeah. Um, um, and I, I would write reading card verse, you know, for family birthdays, whatever, okay. that kind of okay. stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I, as an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old, um, right. right. but definitely more than my siblings. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so when I, by the time I was in high school, I was writing poetry was a little bit. It was just the thing I did. Um, actually, uh, here's a story for you. I think yeah. I might have been in ninth grade. Yeah. Um, it's around there, give or take a year. Um, our school had a poetry contest. Okay. And I won first, second, and third prize and, oh, wow. all, three <laughs> and all three honorable mentions. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it was it was a bit Six embarrassing. Points. Six points. <laughs> yeah. The um, and the, the first prize poem was published in the school yearbook, and it was about not wanting to get my hair cut. Oh. That was the subject. Um, so, so I, I guess I, I guess that's that's that's. There were, uh, in fact, other people who submitted too. It wasn't just me, um, but it, but it was, but it was a validation. And I think you know, you don't realize this is going by, but you know that many poems to get all six of the prizes. Um, was, big achievement. That's a bit at lopsided. That age, at that age, it's a big achievement. Yeah, but. You know, it was a small school of maybe 150 students, so it's not a big school either. Um, but it was a validation. And even if I had just gotten one of the prizes, it was a validation that sort of said, hey, you know, you're onto something. You know, you have a talent for this, maybe whatever. Um, maybe the contest standards are pretty low, but still a validation. I think that was important. So by the time I got in high school, I was already writing poetry with some regularity. Um, but had not heard of haiku, or if I'd had it mentioned to me, it didn't sink in. But in the 10th grade, um, Mr. George Goodburn, who was my teacher for English teacher, uh, had us do haiku. And I think he spent all of half an hour on it. Um, 
And I wouldn't say I was magically hooked. It wasn't really that. It just became another kind of poetry that I also wrote. And it was not privileged. It was just another thing that I also wrote. And um, I would write them occasionally. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe 50 to 100 a year, I guess, mm -hmm. something like that. A lot of the early earliest times, uh, I don't have any record of it anymore. Starting around maybe five years after first learning of it, I started keeping them. Um, and I do have some of those, and they're pretty awful. Um, yeah, it, it became something that was of value to me. And um, yet it was still part of longer poetry that I wrote. However, I be then began over the next, I guess, 10 or 12 years after I first learned of haiku, I began to encounter haiku in books about Zen or Taoism in translation from Japanese. And um, I, it began to add a cultural context. Um, but I remember buying my very first haiku book at uh, Kino Kinio Bookstore near St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And uh, it was a book of Basho translations by Lucien Strike. And um, his, his versions are very minimal uh, in contrast to the syllable counting that I was taught by my teacher um, uh, of 575. These, these translations were not bad at all, much, much shorter. Um, although that didn't strike me as a problem or an issue, I just, it just was. Um, but within the next year, I began to buy a lot more books of haiku um, in 19, the summer and fall of 1987. And um, uh, I, I bought Cor Vanden haiku anthology, second edition of his three editions. And that book changed my life. Um, it, uh, th these were English, these are people writing haiku in English and publishing them. And my goodness, maybe I could do that too. And they were, writing poems that were very different from what I thought haiku was. Uh, and on my haiku notebooks page on my website, you can see almost to the day where I changed my style. I, I always, always used to give titles to my haiku and sometimes rhyme them, whatever. They, they, they were not aware of what was going on in literary haiku. And then the next one has no title. It's not 575, it's not rhyming. And to me, to me, it was a remarkable overhaul. Uh, and the biggest thing that I got from reading Kaur's anthology was a shift from focus, from form to content. In other words, what was I saying rather than what bucket was I filling and trying to say it? And it, it, uh, it really changed my haiku and I think radically improved them. So I, I definitely have George Goodburn and Cor Vanden Heuvel to thank. Uh, you also we asked about mentors. We have them to thank too. <laughs> yes, many people they, do. They, they, give, um, they give us uh, Michael and uh, my you know, favorite haiku of yours. And I attended your Haiku Targets presentation in the uh, Japan Fair, and it impressed me so much. I have kept your mantra in front of me when I write my haiku. Do you know that? That is... Don't write about the emotion, but write what caused the emotion. And I use that as a mantra for, for writing haiku now, because earlier I was a little emotional. So <laughs> I realized so, that we don't have to talk about the emotion. That has to be so subtle. It has to be what caused that. Express that. Yeah. And your and, haiku, the spring breeze one, it's 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 my favorite one. I have quoted it often to so many people. Spring breeze, the pull of her hand as we near the pet store. It's so beautiful. And when you well, shared you. that it was when you were with your girlfriend, it made it even more beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people picture a child. Um, yeah, we, uh, and I that's fine. I'm, I'm happy. Pet store. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy breeze. for that. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Two comments here. One is um, uh, in, uh, I forget what year it was, but some years ago, uh, the state of Washington, where I live near Seattle, legalized yeah. marijuana. Yeah. And so I published a revision to that poem. Okay. Uh, Spring breeze, the pull of her hand as we near the pot store. Oh! <laughs> 
Um, and fortunately, Modern Haiku <laughs> saw the joke and published <laughs> it. So <laughs> there you go. Um, and the second, a second comment is um, that idea of don't write about your feelings, write about what caused your feelings, caused the feelings. is a paraphrase of something that uh, William Higginson has written about haiku. And I would say he's, uh, he's um, my mentor. He, he had been my mentor, not just through his haiku handbook, but through many years of personal correspondence and meeting in person, talking on the phone. He was very encouraging to me including uh, some reviews he did of some of the very first books um, I published with my press. He was so encouraging. And yet he was also, um, I wouldn't say short-tempered, but he was demanding. He, he, he was, I, I, a good word I think is impatient. He was sometimes impatient with me because he, he, he would say, you can do better than that. And uh, I, and at the time, it was kind of stressful, you know, but over time, I think I began to see the wisdom of, of why he was pushing me to, to go farther, I did to do better. I'm not able to hear you, unfortunately. Uh, hello, can you yes. hear me now? Yeah, yes. no, I said he, he must have seen that spark of, you know, excellence in you and he wanted to, you know, kind of take out that potential. That is why he was being, you know, that exacting with you. So, yeah, um, given given my uh, approach to haiku, do, to doing writing of haiku, criticism, book reviews, publishing of haiku, uh, translations, all of this stuff, um, I said to him once, I think you and I are a lot alike. Mm -hmm. And he said, you think? <laughs> Meaning absolutely, and and um, he he said that very clearly. He thought I was following in his in his footsteps, yeah. and he wanted to specifically encourage me because I was doing, at least I think so. Maybe not to his standard yet, but um, I'm doing the varieties of things mm -hmm. that he would do. And he also called himself a haiku coach. Mm -hmm. um, that he was coaching people mm -hmm. and trying to inspire people, mm -hmm. and I think. You know, I may do it a little differently, but I, I valued that idea of it's kind of literary citizenship, give back to the community where you help others, uh, you connect others. Um, it's not just encouragement it's, or advice, it's, it's just general support and, and, and enthusiasm. You know, I, I'm deeply into haiku and that may puzzle some people like my, some of my relatives. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about it, uh, and I, I hope to at least share that enthusiasm. Um, yeah, and if people catch the, the haiku bug, then that's great. So, so many haiku poets have, you know, uh, impressed you, Kaur, you mentioned, Higginson, you mentioned. So which, which are some of the haiku which have, you know, stayed with you over the years? Uh, and uh, why, of course. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> One that immediately comes to mind is uh, by Ruth Yarrow, mm -hmm. and it's a one-liner. Mm -hmm. After the garden party, the garden. The garden, okay. <laughs> After the garden party, garden. Mm -hmm. And she, she's very much an environmentalist poet mm -hmm. uh, and very supportive of the environment. And mm -hmm. her, her shift of focus, you know, she's not against a garden party. But oh, how much she appreciates the garden as well. Um, and that that kind of attitude, I think, is central to a lot of haiku poets, this appreciation mm -hmm. for nature and the seasons. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, not in competition with human activity, unless it's misguided, I suppose, mm -hmm. but it's a recognition that both have a value. Um, and that's mm -hmm. definitely something that I, I get from uh, Ruth's wonderful poem, very minimalist, but so beautiful. Um, uh, another favorite haiku, uh, one by Nick Avis, and uh, I may remember it from my Haiku Targets workshop, because it's the first poem I use in the examples. His poem is, the telephone rings only once, autumn rain. And I think it's the, the fundamental mystery that the poem immediately presents. What does the telephone ringing only once have to do with autumn rain? 
and it illustrates the juxtaposition of the two part structure of haiku and that the gap is created in that shift between the two parts. The telephone rings only once. That in itself has some mystery. Why? You know, we're immediately engaged. Someone changed their mind to be chicken out. Is there a power failure? I mean, there are many different stories. We bring ourselves to it. And then we're still challenged further. What does that have to do with the autumn rain? Um, uh, to me, there's a sound connection. I hear the sound, the sound of the phone. And then, as a sort of consolation prize, I hear the sound of the autumn rain. Or maybe, um, because of the denied communication of the telephone ringing only once, I, uh, well, it's a consolation that I get to hear the autumn rain, but maybe it's the act of the telephone interrupting whatever I was doing that then makes me aware of the autumn rain in a way that I wouldn't be if the phone had not rung just once. So that, that's a poem that, that that's is there, is there a, a sense lot. Of, uh, Michael, is there a sense of uh, loneliness or melancholy in this poem? Yes, for me, very much. It's a very melancholy autumn, poem. Autumn is a, you know, that period when you know fall happens leaves yeah. change color and then rain you know that that sense of a person sitting alone uh, the bell rings and stops and he's and the rain he can hear the rain you know so it's yeah. it, it, it's a beautiful poem it's by nick avis it's beautiful yes it's beautiful and yeah um it's significant that it's autumn because that contributes mm -hmm. to the melancholy feeling yes um if it were spring rain or spring snow or something the, else change the tone of the <laughs> yeah the exactly so it, it's carefully carefully put together very carefully crafted i always yeah. recall the poem you had quoted in your haiku targets and that uh, has also stayed with me for very long because i love birds bitter morning sparrows sitting together without any necks yes hackett um, jw hackett I, yeah james w hackett um, yeah. He lived not far from me when I lived in California, and I had visited his house a few times okay. um, in La Honda, California, a yeah. peninsula just south of San Francisco. Yeah. And then later, he and his wife moved to the town of Haiku on Maui. Yeah. Um, oh. which Hawaii. Is, Hawaii. It, it, yes. Um, it has a different meaning than Haiku as we know it, but... Uh, um, I, it, I forget exactly okay. what it means in the Hawaiian language. You know, but. You know, you know Michael, I was uh, in our uh, part of the world where I stay in Chandigarh, India. We also, this is winter time for us. And outside, uh, we have uh, the air conditioner outside uh, the house where, you know, uh, on top of it, I, I found this sparrow family sitting huddled close together without any necks. And I, and I clicked that picture. And yes. immediately this haiku came to my mind that, you know, it's, maybe he saw such a scene one day and just wrote this haiku because they were just cuddled up together. You know, the whole family of chicks and the parents and there were about four, five of them all huddled together. And it was a cold morning. It was a bitter morning. Yeah. So uh, this poem also, uh, you know, it's, I would say that it is, it's an observational poem in my, in my opinion. What do you what do you think about this poem? So, um, yeah, I think like a lot of haiku, it, it begins with close observation to to yeah. notice the sparrows, you know, their hunched yeah, necks. Hunched up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but there's more to it. I think a key word in the poem is that their sparrows are sitting together. together. It's just like what what you were describing, what you saw is yeah. that these birds were communing together. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. just the hunching of the necks yes. necessary, no, no. but even the togetherness of Huddling them. together. Huddling, huddling yeah. up together. Yeah. So it's a poem of close observation. They were giving warmth to each other. Yeah, exactly. Kind of and, and this is an example of close observation. Um, yes. yes. And this is reminding me of Mary Oliver. Yeah. I love to quote this. She has yeah. what she calls instructions for living a life. She yeah. says, pay attention. And yes. That's the first thing that haiku poets do. We just pay attention to things. We notice mm -hmm. things. And as we practice haiku, we notice things more. So she says, pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. Mm -hmm. And those three things are a recipe, not just for living a life, but for writing poetry or any creative art, uh, but definitely true for haiku. Uh, I think as haiku poets, we're naturally astonished at things. We, 
have what Billy Collins calls ex existential gratitude, where we, we're just grateful for how wonderful life is in all its richness. <laughs> Despite the hardships and the challenges, we're still ecstatic about, about uh, the beauties of the world. And so when we know, when we pay attention to something, we are astonished by it so frequently, even by the dark things. And then the next step is to tell about it. She doesn't say write a poem. She just says express yourself. It could be to tell somebody by talking that you're near. Oh, did you notice? Did you notice the comet that just, you know, or the shooting star that just shot through the sky? Um, whatever it is, um, just to share it, to tell about it, and to celebrate it. And that that to me is, I think, part of where Hackett's poem comes from. It's close. Was observation. He was paying attention. What a wonderful description. Really, attention. You've also translated so much of poetry uh, from the Japanese language, uh, Michael, which is very fascinating. I believe a poem from your translation of the collection of, uh, I, I, my pronunciation may be wrong, Ogura Haikunen and Ishu, uh, was published on the back of 150 million US stamps, postage stamps in 2012. Uh, tell us something about it and how you were introduced to the Japanese language and translating this poetry into English. Well, thank you. Um, that uh, that particular translation was from a book published in 2008, uh, a translation of the Ogura Hyakunen and Ishu uh, that mm -hmm. we called um, 100, I forget exactly what we called it in English, 100 <laughs> Poets, Passions of the Imperial Court. Okay. And it is a collection of 100 poems by one poem per poet, um, okay. compiled in the 13th century by Fujiwara no Teka. Mm -hmm. And um, our, it's a collection of, excuse me, a collection of waka poems. So they're, they are longer than haiku. The tanka, Japanese, they are like, the, they're like that we, we would call them tanka today. So 57577 five, seven, seven sounds in Japanese. Uh, so they're longer, and in the imperial court tradition, they were often love poems, mm -hmm. and they were elevated diction, and um, uh, there were things one should or shouldn't say in uh, poetry of that era, mm -hmm. um, uh, and many of them were sort of disguised love poems. They were symbolic. You'd mm -hmm. send them to your the person you were interested in, and they would um, pose a poem and uh, get it done in calligraphy and have it delivered back to you and you'd flirt that way and then eventually you might meet. Um, uh, that was part of the tradition. And um, the Ogara Hyakunen Ishu a collection uh, pairs poems. So the first and second poem are paired together and the third and fourth and so on. So they sort of speak to each other in, a, in an interesting like a way. Like a and I think... I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Like a conversation between the first and second poem. Yes, and, and the book has been analyzed for the pairing of, of the poems, not just the poems themselves. And I think it was poem number 33 okay. is about um, uh, cherry blossoms. Mm -hmm. And in 2012, uh, the United States Postal Service issued a, a commemorative stamp uh, marking the 100th anniversary of the cherry trees in Washington, D.C. And, um, uh, and they're famous, and uh, it was a wonderful thing for the post office to do. And um, uh, my co-translator and I, uh, Emiko Miyashita and I, were contacted uh, to, to see if, they, if we could, uh, if we would allow them to reprint our translation on them on the back of these postage stamps. Uh, and so it's a sheet of stamps. Uh, I forget how many are on the sheet, but on the backing paper, uh, there's a bit of information about the cherry blossoms and our mm -hmm. palm appears. Um, so we're, we're like fortunate to have had cover, that. Like a first day cover, they take out for stamps, maybe something like that, they do that. Yeah. Um, so the, the backing is actually yeah. on all the stamps that were, that were printed. And originally, uh, so from start to finish, not just first day of uh, covers. Um, and I think originally they they were going to print 50 million of them, and they very quickly needed to print more. And uh, 
I was told that it was one of the best selling stamps in US history, although not as much as Elvis. <laughs> But still, wonderful. Second highest. <laughs> That's great. I, no, I don't. It's I don't great. know if it's second highest, but it was <laughs> in the top in the top ten. It was a very popular stamp. Yeah. And about how how did you, how was your connection to the Japanese language start? How did you get into this? Um, You've been a British citizen, yeah. settled in America. How did Jap Japanese come into your? Uh... So, um, I th I I have had a long interest in uh, Zen and Taoism and reading about that. I, I am not a, a Buddhist um, and I don't practice Zen, but I have at least an aesthetic interest in, in these things. Mm -hmm. And I encountered haiku and translation in these books um, mm -hmm. and a Japanese culture in general, uh, Japanese aesthetics in these and related books. So it was something I just sort of accumulated um, this has been a growing awareness of. Um, and then um, as I began to get more deeply into haiku, it was natural to, to be aware of the Japanese poets and the Japanese version originals of the poems I was reading in translation. So I began to learn a bit about the language. I'm not fluent at all. Uh, the translation work I do, I, I do with uh, a co-translator, Emiko Miyashita, as I mentioned. Um, um, and I could not do it without her for sure. Um, uh, but I, over the years, there have been opportunities to, to do translation projects mm -hmm. with, with her and occasionally with others. Um, and it could be small things like um, a set of poems for the Haiku International Association website, or uh, I've helped translate some poems from the Japan Airlines International Children's Haiku Contest, if they're not originally in English. Um, uh, many, I mean, numerous books that I've worked on with Emiko, including but also a book on bonsai, uh, furoshiki, wrapping cloths, um, no drama, um, and, and other projects. Um, so yeah, uh, just opportunities like that keep, keep coming up. Um, an annual one that I've enjoyed is, uh, um, there's a an organization in Japan called Traffic Culture, and they have an annual photography and haiku contest. And the results are displayed at, in uh, Ueno Station, Tokyo, every fall. And they so they were just on display the last last round of, of winners, just on display, a very large display in the train station for a, a week or two, uh, usually in late October. Um, so that just happened. And and Emiko and I translate all the haiku winners and sometimes commentary about them. And uh, uh, yeah, it's a fun thing to do. Um, and it pays a little as well, which doesn't hurt. Um, yeah, uh, so I've gotten into uh, my limited understanding of Japanese through, through these opportunities. My wife is Japanese and- uh, Yes, that is the key thing. Your wife is Japanese. <laughs> Well, it's actually it's actually not that key because um, we don't speak Japanese to each other. I hear her speaking Japanese with her friends, yeah. her family. But it's uh, an incentive for you to learn if she's there. <laughs> well, occasionally I will ask her, you know, what is this word printed on something? And she'll tell me. Or sometimes she says, I don't know. Okay. Because uh, she hasn't lived in Japan for 20 plus years now. Okay. Um um, but yeah, there's there's some cultural help there. Did you meet sure. her in Japan, or did you meet no. her in America? We met we met in California. Oh, California. <laughs> and she was also we actually got uh, talking about New Zealand. Okay. She was an exchange student uh, in New Zealand, and I um, oh I'm forgetting the timing here. Um, I have, uh, I mentioned it earlier, I have a haiku chiseled stone, the yes. Kati Kati haiku pathway yes. in New Zealand. Kati Kati haiku. <laughs> but, but she and I met before that happened. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, when that happened, um, I thought that was funny. Was and funny. Uh, I, I still haven't been back, I still haven't been there to see it. Okay. Um, and she would like to go back to, to visit New Zealand as well. That's so maybe someday we'll. That's, that's great. 
but you have given back a lot to haiku organizations. Why? You have, I was reading about you and it is so impressive. You have been co-founder of the Haiku North America, the American Haiku Archives, the Seebeck Haiku Getaway. The, you have been the founder of the Tanka Society of America, officer of the Haiku Society of America, Haiku Poets of Northern California and Haiku Northwest. And you also uh, run that uh, National Haiku Writing Month. You, you, I mean, you are the founder of it and you run it yourself. And we would love to know how all these things, you're able to do so much of contribution to encourage and support the various forms of uh, Japanese poetry. So some people ask if I uh, sleep. <laughs> you dream haiku, <laughs> I, you sleep haiku, you eat haiku. Yeah. You drink so haiku. <laughs> I, yes, I do manage to get a, a healthy amount of sleep every night. Uh -huh. um, but I, I find myself energized by these things. And yeah, that's a long list, but it's not all at once. It's, um, not, it's not all. I haven't read all. <laughs> it's too long. Um, well, what I mean is that it's, you know, there was a time where I did this, and then there was a time I did that, and then this. Uh, uh, so they took turns. Um, you're the, publishing, example, you're doing Tundra. I mean, there's so many things. I, if I start reading all of that, then this interview would be all about your accomplishments. Well, they, they, <laughs> they come and go. Um, uh, so for example, the National Haiku Writing Month, um, I, I do the daily prompting every day in February. But for the rest of the year, since we have prompts all year round, I uh, arrange for guest prompters. And um, uh, it's soon to be December 1st, so we have a new prompter that will be starting. And um, so just yesterday, I emailed the person and said, are you ready to go? Because I'll be announcing you soon. And, and they wrote back and said, yes, I'm enthusiastic and ready to go. And so that's my work to get this done. And then I'll post the announcement of it. And then it's handed off to somebody. So in that sense, I monitor it, but um, I'm not I'm not running it all the time. So it's say it's delegated, um, and I just make sure the, the train stays on the tracks. Um, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, but the community supports it, so it sort of takes care of itself that way, and I I just get to watch, which is great fun, and it's very beneficial for a lot of people. They, uh, have been rewarded by it for for many years now. People are learning. It's a big. These are big resources, and your contribution is real. It's I mean, it's it's not something you're just boasting or I'm telling about it. Oh, not it's, it's your con real contribution, and it's it's huge. And you have edited uh, several journals of haiku, and and you are devoting your time and effort to Grace Guts, which is again, like I said earlier, it is a huge learning resource for haiku poets, and. Uh, you know, how do you envision the future of all these genres of poetry? Which are, and, and, and you see how it's catching up. You see how Indian poets are coming up in this now. And you have so many Indian poets with, you know, Kala Ramesh uh, is running this uh, Trivini and we are all part of it and we are learning through all her, you know, efforts. So, so many Indian poets are coming up. Prabhat Kumar Padi, who mentored me. I've never met him, but it's all on the, as a, as a, as a internet resource that, you know, I get help from people. And everybody is so generous to share and uh, you know guide uh, from that. When I was uh, on the Haiku Foundation, I was trying to do some you know uh, workshopping there, and there's the mentorship. And Alan Summers would guide. So I I think that everybody who has reached there has done you know tremendous work in this field through years. I mean, you yourself you started in '76. Imagine how many years. You've You'll, you'll, you'll complete, uh, <laughs> what you'll complete, I, I think you'll be nearly 50 years, you'll be having a haiku shortly. So, <laughs> so I think, I think it, at, at some point, it's natural for people who are involved in these things to start giving back. Um, and I think some of the growth, uh, like just look at India, for example, Kala Ramesh uh, as a leader in that, has energy uh, to really devote to that and has, has done with the Chuveni website uh, something akin to what uh, Jim Cajun has done with the Haiku Foundation. Right. And it's very deep and rich. Um, and it's, you know, many people are involved and, and inspired by the leadership and by the, by the content and support that these initiatives have. Um, 
and I think, I mean, in some in some degree, when you have a leader who really is enthusiastic and gets people going to, to support it, um, you can't help but have growth. And, uh, it's definitely true in India with yeah. uh, what is really a remarkable growth of, of haiku activity just in the last five or so years, yes. but even be, before that too. Uh, I think of Anjali Diodar Chandragar, um, who was also a, a fine ambassador for haiku in India. She was my and, first mentor, Michael. She uh, was my first mentor, Anjali, yes. Dr. Anjali Diodar. She brought yes. me to haiku actually. She brought me to haiku. She was ah. my close by. We lived close by in Chandigarh. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't know that. I enjoyed yeah. meeting her several times when she yes. came to the Haiku yes. North Conference. Came for conferences. Yes, she did. Um, the, she was and great. yeah, she was a, a special person, but but she had she had a sort of vision for haiku, and she wanted to share that vision, and whether it was uh, overt or just she couldn't help it, um, it, it it spilled over to other people and, and caught fire, I think, and laid groundwork, I think, for for Kala Ramesh's work as well, um, and and she's done tremendous things as uh, as well, entirely on her own. Um, or independently um, that have laid more track for other people to explore the haiku country. Um, but yeah, that I mean, if you ask about the future of haiku, uh, I would love to see what's happening in India expand to other countries um, and pick your country. Uh, and there may be things going on that I simply am not aware of, yeah. but imagine if there were, um, well, I was gonna say, Russia, for example, yeah. there are haiku organizations in Russia, and they are active. And there are journals. I know this, but is it on the scale of India or the Haiku Foundation or the Haiku Society of America? Not. I don't know. No, it's not. And I recently visited Vietnam, and I tried to find some haiku poets. I said, if there are some haiku poets, I would love to meet them there. And through a lot of uh, you know these these uh, Facebook groups, but uh, we could hardly find even one or two because it's not popular there. And yeah. a place like Vietnam, which is so you know they ha they have such a rich culture of art and paintings and poetry, but haiku is not reached there yet. So I think there is a lot of there's a lot of world which needs uh, you know uh, more awareness about haiku, and of course it has a beautiful future, which raises. It raises the question, do we do we advertise, do we proselytize for haiku? Yeah. Or do we just be enthusiastic and let people be attracted to it? Yeah. Um, you know. Um, That's something to be deliberated upon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, there, there's yeah. things to be said on both sides of that point. Yeah. But but yeah. here's here's a contrast uh, to Vietnam, perhaps. I have heard that the Philippines has an extremely active haiku. Uh, okay. Apparently, there's a Facebook page, a Filipino Facebook page, oh. with 10,000 people on it. That's wonderful. That's and, really wonderful. You know, I'm just completely not dialed in there. Maybe they just happen to be members of the Facebook page and not really active with haiku, <laughs> but I don't know. Um, Maybe you so should. Partly, we just don't know. Maybe like Basho, you should take some journeys, uh, haiku. <laughs> And <laughs> yeah, so, uh, popularize, popularize this uh, art <laughs> there in all yeah. these countries. You should be a wandering monk. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? Um, yeah, that, that would be great fun I, to I, take I, over. I read, I read that you're fond of music. You had been a DJ. And so I feel that this multifaceted person, as a multifaceted <laughs> person, it gives you that unique and musical edge to your poetry, too. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, it would be wonderful to to visit different parts of the world and, and help uh, spread spread uh, passion for haiku. Yeah, um, but in, it's there's there's also a language barrier. Of course, in that you know I I am aware of what's going on in India because so much of it is in English, and obviously England and Australia and New Zealand and Canada and whatnot. But I don't know what's going on in Brazil in Brazil. Right. I know a little bit, but mm -hmm. and I, I know a little bit about Spain and Germany and Croatia and so on, mm -hmm. but I don't have much depth of knowledge simply because the language keeps me from from knowing. Mm 
Yeah. And there could be a lot more going on than, than any of us realize. Um, um, and some of us realize. Mm -hmm. uh, and so partly it's it's a matter of, of breaking down those language barriers, I guess. Right. And, and come to think of it, uh, see, English is not our first language, if you if you look at it yeah. personally. But it's because, you know, we were given by by British Queen and monarchy, and we were having English as our, most of us studied in English schools, convent schools, and uh, we got, uh, you know, knowledge of uh, everything in English. That's why we were able to write. Otherwise, we would not be able to write. And sometimes, you know, when I read uh, poems, haiku by, by guys like you and people who are from U.S. and uh, Britain, I find there is a difference. You see, you... You think in English, you, 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 you express yourself in English since the time you're born, but we are not like that. English is a learned language for us. So sometimes our expressions, our pronunciations are not as good as we would like them to be to match the haiku which you write. So I think that little bit of exception, sometimes when I submit to editors, I also say that, you know, if, if there is any error, let us know. Let me know so that you know, we can we can improve the, on upon that. Although, see, reading and all does help. I mean, I read a lot. I read a lot. And most of us read a lot. All of us haiku poets are reading so much. And without reading, there would be no writing. So I think it's what, important to yeah. But what is what is I think so good about your stance where you're writing is you will write about different subjects, yeah. maybe with different emphasis different maybe different values um uh maybe there's a slight difference of grammar or spelling or something yeah. but that's part of the voice i think yeah, that the voice yeah. yeah i mean it and it's dangerous to say it's a voice of india because there's so many indias so um, many. Different, different exposures languages. different exposures too different languages yeah. such a diverse country we are having very so many. Yeah, yeah yeah it's very diverse and i i i i wince i uh, our family used to live in Ghana, in Africa, and I, I'm very sensitive to the way some people refer to the Af the entire Africa. continent of Africa as if it's one country, <laughs> as if it's all the same. And it's sort of like, you have no idea. And mm -hmm. I'm hardly an expert. I was there as a child. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, there's, I mean, you can go skiing in Africa, <laughs> you know, Whatever, it's just so yeah, diverse. It's so big and so huge and diverse, of course. Yeah, and I think India is the same. I mean, and and I hardly know, but I just- uh, Have you visited it. India, uh, Michael? Yes, I have, again, as a child. Um, I remember visiting Kolkata and uh, New Delhi. Okay. Places in between. Um, um, but I was I was maybe five or six years old, very, mm -hmm. very thin memories. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so technically I've been there, but I, I hardly remember. But I mean, the mountains, the, the the topics, I mean, everything in between, it's just, wow. Yeah, It's I'll not one India. I'll be meeting Kala and all our haiku poets whom I've never met, or even Kala, I haven't met all these poets. We're having a haiku, Driveni Utsav. Utsav is celebration. We are having it in February, 3rd, 4th, 5th in Pune, where Kala stays. Yeah. So we've all, we are all getting our bookings done and finally we'll meet some 30 odd, 50, 40 odd, odd poets. We'll come there for three days and we'll have all haiku there. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> yes, uh, how many people do you expect to have there? I think 40 to 50. I think 30 have already registered, Kala was saying, but I think we should have about 40 people. Let's hope for the best. It should be good. And she's organizing it uh, very beautifully, working very hard on it. And uh, she wants me to do a kukai because I'm part of the kukai team. She wants me to do an online, online, um, on-site kukai that time. And they'll have a high boon slam where people will read out their high boon. You know, so it's going to be good, interesting. And uh, so it's, I, I mean, you've had those sorts of events before, or at least online recently. Online, we've had lots of things. Kala yeah. has been very active. We've had lots of things. We've done lots of things. We've done ginkgo walks, we've done conferences, presentations, so many things. But meeting face to face is something different. Yeah. <laughs> it's something so different. I mean, it's it's an example of, of growth for haiku. And it's similar to um, the recent haiku down under conference yeah. 
in yes. Australia and New Zealand. Australia, they get, and we get their mails. They're so exciting to read. And how yeah, they meet but, and they talk and they discuss haiku and they write haiku. It's interesting. So <clears throat> that event was online. Yeah. But, you know, it may lead to an in-person event, a regular in-person yeah. event in that, that area. And I could easily imagine it alternating yeah. uh, New Zealand and Australia uh, yeah. locations. Um, yeah. um, but th that kind of that kind of growth and yeah. the people with a vision to make it happen is yeah. is a positive thing. Yeah. And Even the North imagine, America conference, the Renge one, which we did, that was beautiful. I participated in that. So, it's all part in Gary. It was it was great great really to you know yeah. interact with people who write Renge. Renge was a new form, so I really enjoyed it. So we would our viewers would also be keen to know, uh, Michael, are you working on a new book or some uh, anthology of poetry you're editing? And uh, is your book going to come shortly in the bookstores? What is your plan? So um, I uh, am sorely overdue publish a book of my own haiku. Um, I don't have one, basically. I have, I have little chapbooks from years ago. Uh, I have a collaborative book written with another poet. But your um, grace starts is an encyclopedia. Well, yes, so I guess there's a conversation <laughs> there. Um, I, I have a habit of making uh, what I call trifolds. Uh, uh, you know, a sheet of paper printed on both sides and folded into, into thirds. And I, they're printed on nice paper, and I use a, uh, um, I have a chop with my name in Japanese. I stamp each copy with red, um, red ink, and I give these to people. And I make 100 to 200 copies a year, Wonderful. and I make one or two, sometimes three of them in a year. And I've been doing that for 25 years, uh, and it's sort of uh, been, it's sort of accidentally been my alternative to publishing books. Of my own poetry so there's an accumulation of poems that i've given away that way mm -hmm. and i if i added up how much it's cost me it's probably many thousands of dollars to print all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I, I love doing it but i'm very badly overdue for for a, a book of my own poems mm -hmm. and um because i've accumulated so many it's it's really hard to figure out well what which ones would I include? And so on, and so the the months, even years, go by, and I still haven't done that. Um, and I'm not about to say that I'm going to be producing such a book either, unfortunately, um, because I have other other projects that feel more important still. Um, for example, um, boy, where to start? Um, I am behind on finishing up the uh, Hiker North America anthology from last year. And here it is, November of this year already. Um, yeah, so that's that's weighing much on my mind. Um, I have uh, a book uh, called Tide Pools uh, mm -hmm. that commemorates the 10, 10 years of uh, haiku uh, retreats on Gabriel Island, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been working on a reprint of that book that's mm -hmm. much expanded. Uh, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of, of the book. And that's behind, uh, but I need to get that out the door. I have a, a, another book, it's also a reprint, um, uh, called Hammerhorn Lake. And it's a collection of Renge. Mm -hmm. And it's it was the very first book of Renge ever published. And um, it was privately printed and given away for free um, of, I think we made, Maybe fifty or hundred copies. That was it, and it was it was very modest in its ambition. But it's occurred it occurred to me uh, recently to publish it again or properly, and um, I uh, had written this these renge with John Thompson and Gary Gay, and so together we wrote a new renge, and uh, uh, we've developed some other commentary that we're going to do and uh, um, plan to reap publish this book in this new expanded edition, hopefully in the next month or so. So that's the most imminent publication. But again, it's not my own, just my own poetry. I think um, your 2023 is fully booked. Well, yeah, and I have a couple <laughs> other projects as well. Um, oh I'm working on um, a, a, re, a 
republication of Erica Mann's book, The Wordless Poem, okay. with an extensive introduction. And the draft of that is, is more or less done. Um, but there are some, some uh, textual issues I, I need to sort out. And um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get that done. Probably, over, that's probably next highest on my list of things. Um, so how many hours do you give to haiku daily? Oh, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I think your life is devoted to it. Well, we have well, been doing poetry specials, uh, Michael, in our magazine, Wise Owl. And we have covered haiku, senryu, and tantra. And the intention is to make readers aware of these beautiful forms of poetry. This January edition, um, as I told you earlier, is a haibun special. And we are showcasing haibun of poets from all over the world. Interviews by you and Jim Casian as also an article on its form. I'm sure the viewers would love to learn uh, more from an expert like you. You hosted the first English language Haibun contest way back in 1996. So please share a little bit about the special characteristics of a Haibun. Okay, well, first comment is that I know other people are much more deeply into Haibun than I am and are more expert at it um, and are uh, more sensitive to the nuances than I am. Um, but I've been writing them and being aware of them for at least 30 years. And I think I wrote my first one in 1989. Mm. And um, it was just part of the fabric of haiku to, to be aware of haibun. And mm. it just occurred to me, nobody's ever done a haibun contest. So um, I, I thought to do that. and. Um, uh, that was in 1996, and then the anthology of of the results uh, with extra material added to it uh, was published in 1999, mm -hmm. uh, called "The Wedge of Light," and I wrote an extensive introduction for that on uh, definitions of Haibun, um, and that was a survey of what other people, mostly academics, have said about Haibun, mm -hmm. and basically a marriage of prose and haiku. Um, and and the the shifting goes on between the two parts, and it, in that way, it echoes the structure of haiku itself. Two parts within a haiku, you know, they have a, a linkness to them and a shiftness to them, um, and they they create energy by that by that juxtaposition. And I think the same thing happens on a larger scale, the juxtaposition of the prose with haiku, in whatever combination of numbers might might occur. Um, and there's an art to it because you don't want um, um, you don't want things to be too far apart that they're obscure and puzzling, but you also don't want them to the parts to be too close so that they're too obvious. Right. Um, and finding that just rightness distance mm -hmm. between the two is a real art. Um, and um, yeah, that that's the part of the endless challenge. Um, I would also say. You know, there are haiku poets, they write good haiku, and they think, well, I'll try writing haibun. And they're not necessarily strong at writing prose. Uh, and so sometimes that gets, uh, uh, you know, not as much attention as it should get. Or there are people who might be really good at prose and think, well, I'll just throw a haiku in here and it'll be, it'll be a haibun uh, because that's trendy or whatever. And they don't realize that they don't have enough experience to do the haiku part of it well. And even if you're good at both, it's still an extra challenge to make the relationship between the two really, really ignite uh, in some way. And then there's the title. What is the relationship of the title to the whole thing? Does it give things away? Does it misdirect on purpose? Uh, does it set the tone? You know, that's that's another factor as well. So balancing all these things is very difficult. And I think Taibun uh, gives gives you a lot of elbow room, I guess, a lot more space to, to tell a story or set a mood and then shift it in the poem if there's one or shift it in many ways if there's more than one. Um, uh, and that it's, um, it's a particular kind of challenge that not all haiku poets do or have to do or even want to do. But for those who do pursue this, uh, it does give you uh, a little bit more room to spread your wings 
sometimes I will, I will look at a poem somebody's written. And I, I keep, I, I will say, you know, this would be really good in a high bun. Then you could explain a bit more of the context. And that, that's a useful thing sometimes. And not as, not as a crutch, but as a necessity, I think if that makes sense. That's true. And I also feel, you know, when Anjali Deodhar uh, gave me her book of journeys where she used to showcase yes. Haibun, and I read Haibun from you also there, and so many uh, you know, poets. And I felt it's such a beautiful form because the title, the prose, and the haiku, all three, you know, it, it made the whole so beautiful. The, the entire thing became so beautiful and it raised the level of that prose. The, the title as also the haiku and it took it to another level and you know sometimes i when i now that when when i'm reading the haibun submitted for this issue of the wise out i i find that people have not really understood or read about the craft of haiku the title has stemmed from the prose the hai, the haiku has stemmed from the prose or from the title you know the word the title would be the same words would be there in the haiku then it then it's not it's not that quality haibun. The quality haibun where you really feel that yes, you've read something which is a thing of beauty, is when the, the entire thing becomes you know connected. It's a fabric which is woven so well that the title and the prose and the haiku they have a link and shift all through, and that is the beauty of a haibun. And uh, Michael, I would love it if you read one of your favorite haibun for us. It would be wonderful for our viewers. Yes, and uh, in keeping with um, the owl in the wise owl, <laughs> I will read a, a hyphen of mine that's very personal to me yeah. called Hearing the Owl. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> so this, um, this was published in the Hyphen Journal in 2019, but it was originally written in 2006. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's somewhat loop loosely, well, definitely, actually, in British Columbia. Um, um, and part of the, the hyphen will explain some of the details. But um, so it's this part of Canada where there's a, a rich First Nations tradition um, um, that sometimes have suffered great injustices. And in, in, in a way, the whole hyphen speaks to a sense of belonging. Um, my own personal experience, and this is why this hyphen is, is so personal for me, is, um, you know, I was born in England, and then lived in Ghana, and then Australia, and back to England, and then to Canada. And at various times, like in Canada, I had a British accent, so I was a foreigner. And then I remember losing my accent, but still not really being fully Canadian. I became a Canadian citizen at age 17, um, and then shortly after, I moved to the United States for college and so on. So I was a foreigner again and never quite belonged, didn't, couldn't vote. Uh, I would never sign petitions because I'm not a U.S. citizen or whatever. It was always a sense of otherness. And even when I would go back to England, I would have a Canadian accent. I you know, was still a foreigner, still an outsider, always other and never fully belonging. And perhaps an ending to this is my wife and I became U.S. citizens earlier this year. And so I'm still processing this. Do I finally belong here in the United States? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, you, you never give up your, your past. So there's perhaps there's some good things about being other. But this uh, high bun is somewhat about this subject. And it's called Hearing the Owl. And I also have it on my uh, website. On, Skills. And it begins with a, a quote from um, one of the, um, the First Nations uh, uh, groups in British Columbia, the Kwaki uh, And they have a saying that says, a place is a story happening many times. A place is a story happening many times. So here we go. One of my favorite books is Margaret Craven's I Heard the Owl Call My Name. It's a short novel about a priest whose bishop sends him by boat to his hardest parish, where he learns 
when he learns that the priest has but a short time to live, the young priest travels to King Cum Inlet, deep in the remote North Coast waterways, British Columbia, amid the Kwakiutl natives who have accepted Anglican beliefs but still value their native traditions. They hold potlatch ceremonies to welcome the changing seasons and to give thanks for bountiful fishing, bury their dead in trees, and gather for mass on Sundays. It's a tale of cultural encounter, an unexpected kind of love story, an account of difference, similarity, aging, agelessness, life and death, and ultimately a bittersweet tale of belonging it has brought me to tears each time I've turned a particular page. And by the way, this book is one I've read more than any other book, including reading it once aloud. Here's the first poem. Half-carved totem. The warmth of wood chips falling through my fingers. Beautiful. I've enjoyed this book numerous times, including once reading it aloud. So I gave it away already. Reading it aloud on a car trip across the Sierra Nevada. I also read it when attending Expo 86, Vancouver, British Columbia. I had the book in my backpack and would pull it out while waiting in long lines. My favorite pavilion that summer was Spirit Lodge, sponsored by General Motors. The theme of Expo 86 was transportation and communication, and each pavilion outdid itself with bigger and better technology than the next. Interactive video projection walls and magnetically levitated high-speed trains. But the GM pavilion was the opposite of that. The utmost of simplicity, straight out of Kwakiutl culture. The pavilion had a square shape. The ramp around the perimeter gently squared its way upward. On the way, as we walked up this, amid deep green spruce boughs, draping moss and recreations of old growth cedar forests, walls showed paintings, carvings, telling Kwakiutl history and mythology. The symbols on the totems became more engaging when you learned the stories and beliefs behind the eagles, bears, salmon. Muggy afternoon. An endangered species pacing at the zoo. What a pleasure to be reading that book in this pavilion. But the best part awaited us at the top of the ramp. We were ushered into a theater set up like a native longhouse or spirit lodge, where a shaman live on stage started telling Kwakiutl stories. For centuries, and even today, the Kwakiutl always wished for a magical canoe where they could recite an incantation, dip their paddle into the lake or ocean, and instantly travel to wherever they wanted to be, or to be with someone they loved. We still want that magic today, to be beamed up from a distant planet where our spaceship orbits. While telling these stories, the shaman sat and stood and danced beside a fire pit. As he waved his hands, smoke from the fire changed shape and became the objects he described, a canoe, a grizzly, a soaring osprey. It was done with holographic projections and it transfixed us. Ultimately, for me, it swept away all the technology that cluttered the expo blurring the masses, including me. It pulled the hype back to its roots to desire, a desire that every culture, no matter how old or young, wants to improve its communication, understanding and wisdom within its own community and in reaction with others, interaction with others. It pulled back the hype surrounding every culture's pressing desire for easier transportation, not just because it might be done, but to fulfill those longings to be in loved places or with loved faces far away. Nothing has changed. And for me, making that connection between modern civilization and ancient civilizations was thanks to the Kwakiutl culture. 
I thought of the poet H.D., What Really Matters. She said this, I shall be here after the wave passes by. At the end of the presentation, the shaman somehow disappeared from the stage as he and the smoke wafted away. Breathless phone call. Our baby's first kick marked on the calendar. In 2006, I visited the University of British Columbia in Vancouver for a conference. At the university, Kwakiutl and better known in similar Haida cultures are heavily represented in one of the world's most important museums, the Museum of Anthropology. It features the people who populated Cascadia's endless coastal rainforests for millennia before Russian European invasion, those delicate indigenous tribes, the First Nations, and the animal, plant, and fish brothers with whom they lived harmoniously, bears, salmon, and owls. The museum offers the reminder that this land is not ours, theirs that we are indeed still a sort of trespasser, an interloper, though we think we're not. Huge wood carvings dwarf the visitor. Vibrant paintings in primal colors draw in the viewer. It's hard to look away at the ocean views across Georgia Strait, the snow-capped mountains to the west and north. To visit the museum is transcendent and humbling, especially for me, ever the alien, British citizen who became Canadian after living in Ghana and Australia, now living with a Japanese wife in the United States, having never voted, never served on a jury. But on this latest trip, I didn't use, visit the museum, not just because I didn't have time, but because it would have made me sad. Sad for wanting to communicate better with others, to be with loved ones more often maybe even to the point of crying, to the point of drowning, that aching, melancholic sadness, always wanting to belong. First warm night, the hoot of an owl penetrates my totem. Beautiful. Spellbinding. Wonderful, Michael. It is spellbinding. And there is so much to learn from you on the art of Haibun writing. And you say you are not an expert. That's not true. I love the link of the song you have given in the postscript. And, and I uh, request viewers to go to the website, read this Haibun, hearing the owl, and also read the postscripts given below. They are worth reading. Each of them is a valuable resource. And I love this link of the song, a favorite song by Jane Siberry, Bound by the Beauty, because it speaks of what Bruce Cockburn's song refers to as being up among the furs, where it smells so sweet and the ecstasy of thinking about eternity. This for me is a saying yes to life. And this is the kind of belonging I crave and find in nature. This is you, Michael. This is you. Thank you so much. So what advice would you give to upcoming haiku, senryu, tanka, haibun, poets, writers? <laughs> what advice would you give? Run away. <laughs> By that I mean you'll get hooked, you'll get, you'll get uh, addicted, uh, it will consume your life and you will fall in love with it. And, um, and unless you're willing to, to be addicted, be careful. Um, but seriously, um, uh, it's always important to read, uh, read what other people are doing. Um, it's impossible to keep up with it all and recognize that too. Yeah. Uh, but read closely what you can read, yeah. pay attention to it. Um, uh, take yourself to where the poet is. Sometimes we'll, we'll read a haiku and we won't get it. Well, it could be that we need to move to where the poet is to understand it rather than presume that the poet failed in 
needed to move to where we are. You know, what is what are the demands that a poem makes on you as a reader? Uh, Sei Sansui referred to haiku as an unfinished poem. And uh, I, I really like that idea, not in the sense that haiku is deficient, but that it's deliberately partial, it requires us as readers to finish the poem. And we do that by bringing our, ourselves to it. You know, what is our experience? Where have we traveled? What languages do we know? Um, what reading have we done? Um, what people do we know? Um, all of this, we bring our, our entire history and our knowledge to each poem. And, you know, if I read the word chair, you know, I can imagine different kinds of chairs. It's, it's more than that, but that's part of it. That's the start of how we bring ourselves to the unfinished poem. But, you know, if we think of a, of a chair, a family heirloom chair that is in our grandparents' home, and some, somehow we think of that, it, it enriches a reference to a chair, perhaps. You know, there, there's depths to that that we bring to a poem, overtones of, of illusion or context that, that we bring to the poem. And we can trust ourselves. Um, and we can trust ourselves not just as readers, but also as writers to, to, uh, to, to write what's ours, to tell our own story. Um, I think, I mean, there's that old modernist dictum, make it new, you know, as if always innovating is, is the holy grail. Well, I, I don't entirely agree with that. I think, I think you have to move forward. You know, the shark needs to keep swimming kind of thing or it drowns, I get that. But I really like what Jane Hirschfield said and it's to me, I don't know if it's a rebuke to the make it new thing, but I think it's a it's, it's an addition to it that's helpful. Jane Hirschfield said, make it yours. And I love that idea. You know, trust yourself. Don't try to have a voice. Don't vent a voice. Just be yourself. Your voice will take care of itself. And if you read a lot, write as much as you can, um, share it and get feedback. Uh, However, whatever you do as part of your community, uh, you will grow as a writer, uh, whether it's haiku or any kind of writing. And um, relax, relax into it. If you're not running away, at least relax <laughs> and, and just be yourself. That's so beautiful, Michael, and so well said. As Jim Casian says in his, on his website, he says in some article I read that Haiku is the longest poem in the world. <laughs> I love that because like you said, it's an unfinished poem. We have to enter it and enter it with our own voice, with our own truths and our own experiences. And it's so beautifully said. Thank you so much, Michael, for taking time out of your packed schedule. I know how packed it is to speak to the wise owl. Your contribution to Haikai literature and its promotion in is is absolutely inspiring and it's amazing. We wish you all the very best in your creative pursuits and endeavors. And we hope to see you someday in India and it would be wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. Thank you.